On the 18th of March 1937, students at the New London School in Texas were attending their final lessons of the day when a massive explosion ripped through the school. This explosion would devastate the local community, but would also lead to widespread changes which remain in place to this day. The New London School explosion would go down in history as the worst disaster ever to strike a school in the United States of America. The city of New London is located in the Rusk County area of Texas. The settlement was established in 1855 when a post office was built to help serve the expanding southern frontier. Throughout its early history, New London relied on agriculture. But this changed in 1930 when oil was discovered in the East Texas oil field. Overnight, New London became a boomtown. While the rest of America was mired in the Great Depression, New London was becoming increasingly wealthy. A new school was built in 1932 for around $1 million, with further additions two years later. It was a lavish high school with an elementary school attached, as well as a gymnasium and a football field, which was the first field with electric lights in East Texas. It was built in a California Spanish style with a red tiled roof and two stories on the main E-shaped building. It was a beautiful, modern school for a wealthy city. There was a debate between the architects and the school board, however, about which heating system they should use. The architects suggested that there should be a boiler and steam system, but the school board opted instead for 72 individual gas-powered heaters to be installed throughout the school. This kind of heater was in use all over America at the time, and wasn't seen as at all unusual or dangerous. As the school was built on sloping ground, there was a large airspace underneath the structure, which is where the gas pipes would be plumbed in. By 1937, the school was looking for ways to save money. They were spending around $300, equivalent to around $5,000 in the year 2020, per month on gas from the United Gas Company. So they decided to do something that was common practice in the area at the time, and plumb into the residue gas line of the Parade Gasoline Company. Parade Gasoline was in the business of extracting oil. Doing so often resulted in natural gas being extracted as well, but this low-quality gas was considered a waste product, and was usually burned off. As a result, the company would turn a blind eye to anyone siphoning off their residue gas. This residue natural gas, which was colourless and odourless, was delivered to each room through a 4cm, or 1.5 inch pipe, which connected to a 5cm, or 2 inch pipe, in the basement of the building. On the 18th of March 1937, a parent-teacher association meeting was being held in the school gymnasium, a separate building around 30 metres, or 100 feet, from the main school. The elementary school children had been dismissed at 3pm, and were making their way home or waiting for parents who were attending the meeting. High school classes were due to be dismissed at 3.30pm. Around 500 students and 40 teachers were in the main building of the school. Throughout the day, several students had reported experiencing headaches. But other than that, it was a day like any other. Nobody present at the school was aware that a leak in the gas piping had, for several hours, been allowing gas to accumulate in the basement and lower floors of the school. At approximately 3.17pm, Limmy Butler, a woodshop instructor, began using an electric sander which, due to its unreliable condition, had been given the nickname Old Sparky. Mr. Butler had recently repaired the sander so that it was ready to use again. As he switched on the machine, a spark was generated. This spark ignited the accumulated gas, and the flame was carried below the floorboards into a void space completely filled with gas. Instantly, there was a huge explosion, which was heard up to six and a half kilometers, or four miles, away. Eyewitnesses described the whole building bulging and rising into the air before crashing back down to the ground. The walls collapsed and the roof caved in. A massive concrete block was thrown from the building and landed on a car 60 meters or 200 feet away. The air was filled with debris from the blast. Black smoke and red clay dust created a spiraling cloud in the air. The parents from the PTA meeting were the first on scene. Students that had been able to evacuate the building were suffering from shock, unsure what had happened or what they should be doing. Firefighters soon arrived, 
but as there was no fire, they joined the search for survivors amongst the rubble. Soon, they were joined by workers from the oil fields in the surrounding area, who had witnessed the blast, and many of whom had children at the school. The governor of Texas dispatched Texas Rangers, the Highway Patrol, and the National Guard to the scene to aid the rescue attempts and to help control the anxious crowds that were gathering at the scene. Medical aid arrived from Dallas. 100 nurses, 30 doctors, and 25 embalmers, who worked in makeshift field hospitals in the buildings around the school. There was no hospital in New London, but a hospital was due to open the following day in nearby Tyler, so this facility started accepting the victims. 100 children were taken there, but there were only 60 beds. Rubble was initially moved by hand or using a shipment of peach baskets that were delivered to the scene. Later, heavy machinery and floodlights from the oil fields were delivered. When two news reporters were sent to the scene to report on the blast, they were told that helpers were needed far more than reporters, and so they joined in the rescue effort. The school principal, Troy Duran, was responsible for identifying the dead before they were taken to temporary morgues, one of which was at a nearby ice rink. School bus driver Lonnie Barber was taking elementary students back home when he heard the blast. He nonetheless completed his route, reuniting children with their worried parents before returning to look for his own four children at the site of the explosion. Tragically, his son Arden had not survived. After 17 hours of searching, all of the victims had been recovered, with each individual basket of rubble painstakingly searched for body parts before it was removed from the site. Even after all of the bodies had been recovered, there was a heightened state of panic and confusion. Parents fought over the bodies, desperate to discover what had happened to their children. Victims were frequently misidentified. One student, W.G. Watson, recalled hearing his own name listed as one of the dead on the radio. 294 people, students and teachers, were killed in the explosion. Funerals were held at a rate of three or four each hour at the local cemetery, which set aside an entire section to bury the victims. The story was reported around the world. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt sent a telegram to express her sympathy, as did the leader of Germany's Nazi party, Adolf Hitler. In the aftermath of the disaster, the governor ordered a military court of inquiry, but was stymied by the fact that most evidence had been destroyed in the blast. It was determined that the gas leak was likely to have been in a faulty connection where the school tapped into the residue line. Gas had accumulated in the void space under the floor and the basement, steadily rising until a spark had ignited it. No school officials were found liable for the blast, which angered many parents. Several lawsuits against the Parade Gasoline Company were initiated, but due to a lack of evidence, all were dismissed. The shock and horror of the tragedy did prompt swift action from authorities. By May 1937, two months after the blast, House Bill 1017 was approved and became immediately effective. This required a strong-smelling malodorant to be added to natural gas, so that people would be able to tell if there was a leak. This is now standard practice all over the world, a simple intervention that has without a doubt saved many, many lives. A memorial was built in 1939 and stands today in front of a new school which was built as a replacement. An exhibit in the New London Museum displays artifacts that were rescued from the wreckage, including a classroom chalkboard which reads, Oil and natural gas are East Texas's greatest mineral blessing. Famed broadcaster Walter Cronkite was a junior reporter for United Press at the time of the disaster, and attended the scene. He went on to cover World War II and the Nuremberg Trials, as well as anchoring the CBS Evening News. Late in his career, he said, I did nothing in my studies nor in my life to prepare me for the story of the magnitude of that New London tragedy, nor has any story since that awful day equaled it. <laughs>